city attorney for Los Angeles here with us, Heidi uh, Felstein. We thank you for coming and she's here to also listen to the students. So thank you very much. And we will start first with the uh, video. So the encampment used to be right there and now the area is closed off. Um, and right there we have uh, pro-Palestinian groups doing a die-in. They call it divest from death uh, for Gaza. I'm on the campus of the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles, where things are tense. It's pretty hard to get on campus because security has blocked off the entrances to all non-students and staff. We made it in to show you what it's been like over the last few weeks here. As a journalist, they've been pretty hectic weeks because, you know, like there's so much happening on campus and we're still students and we're overwhelmed by the way the university has acted. Clearly, tensions are really heightened on campuses across the country, and that includes USC. Students are locking arms to try to protect that Seder and these students outside of the main gates from someone who's pretty angry about what he sees happening here. On April uh, 4th, the university announced the valedictorian, the highest ranking student on campus. The university went through the process and they selected Asna Tabassum to be their valedictorian. Now, a tradition that a valedictorian has is that they speak on the day of commencement. But shortly after uh, pro-Israeli groups called for her removal, the university decided, citing security concerns, unnamed security concerns, to take away that honor of her speaking. And since then, we had protests with students marching, chanting, let her speak. Um, the university responded. They responded by taking away commencement. Uh, and this was also in latest with the protests that happened with many students joining in solidarity with encampments across campus. They said that um, it was trespassing in order to create encampments um, in that park over there. They were just tents. There were not only campus security, but LAPD showing up in riot gear to what had been a peaceful demonstration. It was like eight, eight o'clock-ish when um, the security guards took out their batons and turned to us. And it was just this moment of realizing they're really here for us. The administration is so terrified of what we have to say that they called riot police on us to what had been a peaceful demonstration and actually at the time still was. And it's shocking that the university that, that I will carry an undergraduate degree from for the rest of my life is a university that could do this to its students. Wow. That's all, all the LAPD, none of them are any not like Number campus security. security. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually see someone who was arrested. I'm going to ask them if they want to talk. Police had used basically intimidation tactics to separate the people that were not willing to get arrested from the ones that were. This was like a clear example of university officials becoming very hostile. I think that this is a place we come to learn every day, and there's a certain spirituality that it takes to, you know, want to learn somewhere and want to feel safe somewhere. So it was fear-inducing, but I think at the same time it was a small taste of what, uh, like, Palestine and Gaza live through every day. Campus police patrolling, and across the street, Muslim students are holding Jamaat prayer. They're being protected by a chain of supporters and allies to ensure their safety. It's been a hard time, uh, and added that, like as a Muslim student, it's, it, it doubles down on how I feel. My university is not listening to me. My university is not listening to its Muslim students. It's not listening to its Muslim valentine. It all sort of weighs down on you and what you can do, and the best I can do right now is, is show the world what's happening on campus, and I'm not doing it alone. There's not just me, there's like so many journalists here doing that job. When, uh... When I visited the student campus, they were all peaceful. In fact, the one I attended at USC, there were four young ladies who were taking pictures for their graduation. There were some people just hanging out around Tommy Trojan. Uh, there were people walking around. Everything was peaceful. Um, UCLA, the same thing. And then I attended some others on the, uh, on the East Coast. Um, and we, we, we were amazed at this media reporting uh, of these encampments. Um, the violence actually started uh, on, the, on the night, when was it, a Wednesday night, I believe, at UCLA, when there was an assault on the students uh, in the encampment. And to this day, there have been no, uh, I think there was one arrest, and the district attorney for the county of Los Angeles dropped the case uh, against the, one of the culprits that was actually found on video attacking the students. And to my knowledge, there are no other arrests. 
Um, if anybody commits violence against an individual, that person should definitely, just like we were talking about international criminal courts, no matter what side, if you commit a violation of law, you should be brought to the court of justice. Same thing here in violence. Uh, but student encampments is not a violation of any U.S. law. If the, the, the university wants to claim trespassing or there's something else going on, um, that's far from um, somebody actually committing violent crimes. Um, uh, I was informed, however, by somebody that there's a New York Times article that most of the students who were arrested uh, in the encampments, uh, most of the charges have been dropped. And we called on the city attorney for Los Angeles to drop any and all charges against the students who have been protesting uh, the genocide here in Gaza. And she's here with us today. So again, we thank you, Madam S uh, Attorney, for for being here. And, and we'll continue to work, work with you and all city officials to ensure that while the student voices are heard and protected, especially their First Amendment, um, that we also protect all people uh, on the other side, uh, the pro-Israel side, in terms of their safety uh, and, and protection uh, as well. And to have a civil discourse about this issue, issue and not letting it deteriorate to fights on the streets, uh, which is not who we are, which is not who we are as Americans, uh, regardless of which side we're on. So we want to now turn our attention to the students themselves. They will identify themselves again. We ask no pictures, no videos, no social media postings. Uh, they've been under attack enough already. Uh, some students decided not to come today, again, for fear of retaliation. Uh, and this has been going on for decades in terms of ruining people's careers who take on the Palestinian issue. Um, and we've seen that, uh, again, throughout. There's something called the Canary Commission that basically is designed to go after uh, academicians, faculty, students who support the Palestinian issue and to make sure they never get a grant and they, and they don't get jobs. So uh, we ask that we protect uh, these wonderful leaders who, again, out of their moral compunction for justice, ha have spoken out. Uh, Greetings, everyone. My name is, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Joshua. I am a UC Santa Barbara alumni. I am also a organizer for Latino Muslim unity. I participated in and supported several encampments, including UCLA. Um, I would definitely say that UCLA was far different than all the other experiences that I had. Um, I was at the Cal State LA encampment which was very tame and, and the energy was quite different, not because of the students, but because of what the environment was around them. Uh, it, it goes to show that every university has a different level of connection and ties to the military industrial complex, to the ruling groups, to just big high profile donors and it's just, it's a little bit different for each place. I would like to talk about my alma mater, UC Santa Barbara. UC Santa Barbara has a, a military project in the engineering department, which is what you know, the Department of Defense and, and the uh, Armed Forces do. They use these the universities as, as laboratories, the engineering departments to develop their um, projects and, and objectives. So rightfully so, it's not, it, it has nothing to do with the students and the students' education a lot of the times. You know, the, the backlash that they're facing, it's about something really powerful um, that has nothing to do with them. Um, so I remember at the UC Santa Barbara, uh, we got a call. So the students decided to occupy a hall you know, in solidarity with Gaza. And the university sent military MRAP vehicles uh, to suppress the students. I don't know if any of you know what that looks like, but those are the, the, the big vehicles. They almost look like tanks. 
they're the ones you you would see, you know, during the war in Iraq or Afghanistan. I mean, this is this is fully plated, fully armored military vehicles that they're that you see on the campus. And it was just <laughs> it it was really mind blowing. Um. But I want to go back to the UCLA encampment. Um, I think geographically, where it is, really in the heart of very ultra wealthy, ultra Zionist community, right in their backyard, was super dangerous for them. You, I could tell the moment I stepped on. I went to the second attempt, the last attempt to put up an encampment, and you could just, I could just tell the moment. I stepped on campus that it, I was not safe and that this was just a different level. Um, I I didn't even spend that much time putting up the tents. I was, uh, my friend and I were driving in supplies and even that alone was very precarious. Uh, we parked right in, right in this little loop in front of the campus, right in front of the lawn and Right away, all the security swarmed us. They swarmed us. They got real close to us. They brought their phones out. As, as they say, a full attempt to intimidate, intimidate and, and scare you into, and we, were, we didn't even, we weren't even in the encampment yet. We were just dropping off supplies. So they got, they got so close to us that they, they were trying to film our license plate and we actually got into an altercation because they weren't acting like security. They were acting like thugs. Um, they were getting in our space. They were trying to, you know, we weren't breaking any law or anything. So I could just tell it, you know, it, the, the energy was really different. But yeah, Apex security, the folks that were basically the front line of defense for the opposition, they, Again, they didn't they didn't follow any typical security procedures you would imagine from a security group. They would they were literally just paid thugs. They would come and, and, and bully and push around and assault people. My friend got her shoulder dislocated um, by one of them, you know, and it was it was just it, you could you could tell there was just a deeper there was a serious conflict of interest with a lot of the, the people that the the security and police forces that you know were on the other side you know it was a lot deeper than just as i say than than just security or keeping everyone safe it was a lot more to that um but i'll just i'll just leave it off with this you know i graduated a few years ago and we never had an encampment we never had any the level of militancy, the level, the level of um, resistance that these students are learning and are practicing and embodying is so powerful. I mean, the fact that they know how to, all these students know how to put up a barricade, I mean, that is just so much hope for us. I think everyone in this room knows that we need to challenge the existing order, that the, that the order is malicious, it's barbaric, and it, and it doesn't serve our interests. So, to have this, you know, it's, of course it's sad when they take down the encampments and, you know, you see these, you know, all this hard work kind of go down, but it's a marathon, you know, and they, these encampments aren't going away and they're gonna keep going and going and it's, it's just, it's really, uh, op it's really encouraging to see. So I'm, I'm really optimistic going forward for the student solidarity movement. Thank you. Can I write again? My name is Ayat. I'm a fourth year Palestinian student at UCLA. And I'm honored to be here today with you all and just talk about my experience with the encampment and everything that followed on campus. Um, honestly, I like to think of our encampment as the waking point for so many people at UCLA because it really revealed to the students and the faculty how the administration genuinely does not have our best interests in mind. Um, I wanna remind everyone of the purpose of the encampments, which was honestly a way for us to peacefully protest and express ourselves 
with the goal of getting our demands met, which is literally for our own tuition money to not be spent on funding a genocide. I'm sure we've all seen clips of the UCLA encampment. It went pretty viral, but for the sake of time, because I can talk about it for hours, I'm gonna focus on the main event that really shook everyone, which was the night of April 30th, and I'll never forget that day, um, because that was the night that the counter protesters showed up at midnight with fireworks, bear mace, weapons, and brutally attacked students for four hours straight while the security was just standing there and watching. Not a single thing happened. They were just standing there watching. And I vividly remember just looking around and seeing everyone running around screaming, people being bare maced, people having fireworks thrown at them. People, one of our classmates' head was like cracked open. He had to get 14 staples. And I remember someone calling 911 to come and bring an ambulance and them literally saying they're not authorized to be there. So we had to have students literally volunteer themselves to drive many students to the emergency room to get them checked out because people were just, they were injured and the ambulance couldn't come apparently. Um, sorry, I just wanna make sure I hit every point. Um, so on top of that, once the police showed up, um, they just stood there for a couple minutes and didn't do a single thing. And when they did show up, most of the counter protesters were already gone and not a single one of them was arrested. Not a single, no disciplinary action was taken towards any of them. And how did the school respond to that? The next day they sent a huge email, basically putting the blame on us, saying that we had a violent encampment and that it needed to be shut down. So they responded by sending multiple police departments the next day, including the SWAT team, to wipe us all out. And they used really brutal methods. They started um, shooting students with rubber bullets and obviously hitting students with batons. And they were there for six hours just fear mongering. They told us they were gonna take the encampment out around like 6 p.m. I believe and they didn't actually do anything until 2 a.m. And I just remember thousands of students like sh coming from all over Southern California, like people from UCSD, people from UCI, people from all over Southern California showed up to like stand with us and support us. And unfortunately, they ended up taking it all out and arresting over 200 students. Um, So on top of that, not a single counter protester. There was so many videos of evidence of students who were attacking and not a single counter protester had a, anything happen to them. The dean sent us an email saying that he was going to put out an investigation and like look into everything and as of now, nothing has happened. But I do wanna say that Although the encampment was a really horrifying and traumatizing experience for a lot of students, there's a lot of good things that came out of it. And one of that is just the community that it brought together. I remember walking into the encampment and every single race, every single ethnicity, every single religion was there. And suddenly like there was no difference between me and like my Jewish friend, like we were all the same, we were all there for the same reason and everyone was so supportive of one another and so loving and we really saw that because even after the encampment ended, everyone was like a family after that. Like you see people walking around that you recognize from the encampment and it was like you guys have known each other your whole life. And that was just something that was really beautiful to see on campus, especially as a Palestinian student, I feel like my whole life, like a lot of people didn't even know what Palestine was a couple years ago. Like when I vividly remember being young and like people would ask me where I'm from and I'm like, oh, I'm from Palestine. And they're like, 
you mean Pakistan? And I'm like, no, Palestine. And then I'd have to explain to them what it is, and then I pull up a map to show them, and then I realize it's not on the map, and then I have to explain to them why it's not on the map. So it was just beautiful to see how much recognition and how so many different races and ethnicities and everyone was just coming together and like for one cause, and there was really no difference between any of us. So that's one thing that came out of Encampment that was you know beautiful to see, I guess. But yeah, and then Sema's gonna talk more about the impact that the encampment left after it got taken down. But thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sema. As I have just said, I'm also a fourth year student at UCLA. Um, to talk about the encampment, I have already went over like the brutality of it and everything we faced, unfortunately, throughout it. And so I want to touch upon what happened after the encampment because it didn't end when they took down our encampment. We kept going and there was more and more responses. Um, as I had emphasized, like this encampment brought a community together. It brought us all together. We all knew each other. We all became one. And honestly, it built beautiful friendships. Me and Ayat were acquaintances before the encampment and we stood there together side by side the entire time it was open. and. Now I feel like she's one of my sisters. Like we created a beautiful bond just through being there together. So Alhamdulillah, I was able to bring all these students together and even strengthen our ummah together because now we're all truly brothers and sisters in Islam and we've been through this together. We saw each other in pain. We saw each other crying and we were able to help each other up and like heal our ummah, Alhamdulillah. The things I wanted to talk about was what happened after it was shut down and what administration decided to do. The first thing they did was, as Ayat said, they decided to send out an email the day after the attack and as well as the day after we were shut down. And this email, it just put all the Palestinian and pro-Palestinian students down, unfortunately. It talked about that we were the violent ones and it needed to be shut down for safety issues and they were going to look into us. Not only that, they arrested 200 of our fellow classmates, unfortunately. They were taken in. They were not treated fairly, they were circling in these jail buses just to waste their time. They held them there for as long as they could. They didn't let them use the restroom. Like We got accounts from all of our fellow students of how they were treated, and it was nowhere near just. They even took some of these students' phones. They took their laptops, and these are students in school. How are you expected to continue education? You don't even have your electronics that you need to work on. And this was all just like their investigation with no plausible cause for why it was being taken, why they were being treated this way, unfortunately. And they were eventually released. We waited for them outside of jail support and they were all let out and they just have meetings. Our, our school decided to now have administrative meetings and provide disciplinary action towards our students instead of protecting them from what went down these two nights when we were attacked. They're holding them. They didn't let some students take their finals. They didn't let some students graduate. It was just an array of things that they were putting down on them. And then even during the summer, I know people who have their meetings to go into court and speak about what happened, how they were held. So UCLA really took no part in trying to protect these students or make them feel better about what happened. They didn't even want to listen to us because in the encampment, they wanted to bring someone to speak to us and the chancellor himself wouldn't even come speak to us. He's the one making all these shots and sending out these emails to us, but he didn't even take 20 minutes out of his day to come speak to us. He sent in the vice chancellor and for every question we asked, his answer was, there's nothing I can do. It's not in my hands. And then the next day we got an email declaring that it was the chancellor himself who sent in UCPD. So it was in his hands and he was just neglecting what we had to say and just trying to shut us down and get everyone to leave and scare us out of there, telling us if you don't leave, if you get arrested, there's gonna be disciplinary action. Um, unfortunately, we've seen this across a lot of the UCs, even like every encampment has been shut down and we haven't seen them divesting because they rather put their money into genocidal funds instead of protecting their students and what we have on campus. Another thing I wanted to talk about was after that, we had other Palestinian events. We weren't able to set up another successful encampment, but any protests we had, the amount of police that came out already in their riot gear waiting for us, ready for us to be there, even though they weren't there the day we needed them, the day we were getting attacked, nobody was there to protect us. They were on the sidelines watching. As soon as they heard of any pro-Palestine event, the jail bus came around, the riot gear came around, every single police force you can think of 
came around and shut down and arrested students. And it's just heartbreaking to see that this is their main concern is arresting the pro-Palestinian students, trying to speak instead of keeping them safe, even if it was just a simple protest. And it just felt like that campus, UCLA, was no longer our campus. It wasn't the students' campus. It was now UCPD's campus. We would walk around campus just to class even, and I would see police officers. And, and as I walk, because I'm visibly Muslim, they, they just stare at you. They look at you the entire time. They're watching every move you do. I walk into lecture halls, and they're just eyeing you the entire time as if this isn't my school. I'm not here for my education. I'm not just a threat to them. That's all we're known as. And unfortunately, we even faced students getting harmed outside of campus. And where is the police again? Nowhere to be found. There's been reports of multiple students getting attacked, unfortunately. And I work in one of the dorm halls, and there's attacks that have been reported in the dorm halls. And nothing is coming of it, unfortunately. So we just don't feel like this is somewhere we can be, somewhere we can be safe, unfortunately. And that's just something that's really heartbreaking to see since this is where we should be feeling safe. But as I can sit here forever and talk about how unjust we've been treated and how UCLA is not caring for us, I just want to emphasize that when I look back on this year, when I look back at my junior year at UCLA, I'm not going to remember the studying or the classes. I'm going to remember the community and the support I felt, not only from the UCLA students, but from everybody around us, even everyone here today supporting us and hearing us out and wanting to help us just reach justice for Palestine as we're all aiming for the same goal, inshallah. And I just want to leave you guys with one message before I finish talking, and that's to never give up. Because although we didn't see divestment from our encampment, there will be something coming. We saw in Gaza, they saw us, and they thanked us for our efforts out here, and we're just giving them hope out there. So never feel like we're not doing anything. We're always pushing forward, even if it's small steps, we'll eventually get there, and everything will be. Could, could either or... or Joshua, you're you're not Muslim, correct? You're not. No. Okay. We just want to make this is an this is a multi faith uh, panel, um, and um, could you uh, also talk about what you expect come next month for USC? I think UCLA restarts end of September. Are these encampments going to come back up? Is there going to be more student protest? So. I don't really know the details, but I know for sure that they're not gonna stop. They're gonna keep pushing and pushing until something happens. <laughs> and I think it's important to realize that even though we didn't get divestment this time, the tide really turned. Like, seeing how the administration handled all that and how it was really clear who they were protecting really made so many people realize there's something going on here, there's something wrong. Like Even if they didn't know what was happening in Palestine, seeing how the administration handled everything made them realize something is wrong, this isn't right, and we need to look into this more. I remember walking into a research meeting like the week after the encampment, and literally our investigator had up on the whiteboard like Free Palestine written out. And I looked at her and I was like, Is this here from before or something? And they're like, No, like we put it up, you know, like we saw what happened and that's not okay. And like we really need to like stand up for what's going on. And I was just like in shock because it just showed me how much this has spread. Everyone is aware of what's happening now. And I think that's a very important first step to getting change. <clears throat> um, and you, you guys have done all the heavy lifting. And you know, again, your courage and bravery uh, is, is impressive. The little thing that we could do and we did uh, as the Muslim Public Affairs Council, our office in Washington uh, called and filed for an investigation of UCLA into what happened to the students. And they did agree to launch an investigation. And we're gonna continue advocating for your rights uh, until they are met and, and that the university and the government complies. So just a little, little thing that we're 
we're going to do and continue to do and, uh, and ensure that our Constitution is upheld. The First Amendment says you have the right to protest. You have the right to redress grievance. You have the right for peaceful assembly. You have the right you know, to not be imposed with one ideology or religious way of thinking. So um, that, that is what is at stake, and, and you're at the front lines of that. Um, also, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that have been erased is the presence of Palestinian Christians, um, and that there have been, obviously, you know, <laughs> at least 2,000 years, uh, Palestinian Christians. Uh, and uh, they, they are not acknowledged, um, and yet they are an, a, an important integral part of the region. And so with us, we have somebody from uh, the Palestinian Christian Movement for Justice, Rhonda, who would like to say a few words. I'm short here, so hopefully. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Brenda from Palestinian Christians for Justice. Um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for everybody for being here this um, afternoon, and for the students for sharing their stories. I uh, fully support all of you, and I'm sorry for everything that you had to go through and endure, because it honestly is shameful. It should have never turned out that way. Um, I'm not a student, but I'm here to represent the Palestinian Christian population. Um, I was at the UCLA encampment. I was there. Um, we helped get donations to set up, and it was such a beautiful experience to see everybody come together to support these students, because this is our future. They're our voices, and that's what we need to do. Um, you know, and one of the uh, days that I was there, it was Depke, it was beautiful, it was community together standing up for justice. People that I know were there, there was never a reason to see the violence that came, that ensued after. Um, I was there the evening that um, they took down the encampment. I wasn't on the inside. We were initially when, um, they set off the flash grenades, and it was terrifying, honestly, and it was unnecessary. I didn't see anything in the encampment that deserved for that type of uh, reaction. Um, the students banded together, and honestly, it was such an inspiring thing to see. And um, the way that these things occurred at the encampments, the way the police responded, the way the campuses responded, I believe has created a domino effect. And it has allowed this emboldened behavior that we continue to see. And I'll speak on our experience. I actually um, organized an event yesterday at the Harvest Crusade. If you're not familiar with the Harvest Crusade, it is a huge evangelical Christian um, event that occurs every year. Now, I used to attend uh, an evangel. I've left three. The minute they speak about anything regarding Israel and, and their stance and support, I'm out. I leave. And Greg Laurie is uh, one of the leaders for the Harvest Church. And so they have this big movement, this big event every year, and it's grown so big that they packed the entire Angel Stadium. So we recruited people and we went over there, we created pamphlets uh, debunking Christian Zionism. Now, I was one of the people at the land sale um, protest and that was a terrifying experience. Um, I was called horrific names the minute I got out of the car. Um, out of respect for the building that we were in, I won't repeat those names. Um, but as a Palestinian, we feel like we've been reduced to nothing, invaluable. And there was fear stepping into this big event with thousands of what you might say mostly consist of nation, American national Christians um, with these shared extreme ideologies. So our approach was let's go in, let's have conversations. Let's educate, not agitate. So we created pamphlets, the pamphlets 
with Bible verses debunking this idea that Israel, which truly in the Bible does not exist and should not exist yet. It is symbolic of the believers of God, believers of Jesus. And they've taken that and they've twisted it. They've taken our Bible and they've twisted it, which is a very painful experience for us. And so we passed out flyers, we spoke with people, and the majority actually received us well. So I was happy to see that, like I said, very nervous after what happened at the land sale. Um, but there were negative experiences. I had one gentleman tell me that, you know, this started October 7th. We all know it started probably way before 1948 as they were planning all of this. And um, he said, Palestinians don't exist. They're a made up people. And I said, I'm, I'm standing before you, I assure you. I'm not made up. And I mentioned how my grandfather was displaced in 1948, my grandma and grandpa, on deaf ears. I looked at my partner as I made sure everybody stayed in pairs for safety reasons. And I said, let's go. This is not a conversation worth having. And I think as um, Palestinians and supporter of Palestinians, we need to remember that that is the light that they want to paint us in. So it's not worth having that conversation. But we passed out 500 flyers and we had really beautiful conversations with others. So I left knowing that we planted seeds. And however those seeds grow, and wherever they plant those seeds, I'm happy to know that we made some sort of impact. I don't care if I changed even one mind. So with that being said, please let people know that we do exist. As I was telling people yesterday, Palestinian Christians exist. And if I could show you videos of their faces when I said, I'm a Palestinian Christian, one of the originals from the, descendants of the originals from the Holy Land. People just froze. So I know the power that we hold in this movement and I am trying to encourage more to come to step out and to speak up. And we stand together. This idea of dividing us by religion no longer. So thank you for having me and thank you to the students for all that you've done. Assalamu uh, alaikum. A little bit of an introduction to this video. You have all listened to eyewitness uh, from the students who were at the uh, different encampments, whether at UCLA. And you also wit witnessed the uh, uh, eyewitness uh, from one student and the, ge the senior gentleman who shared their experience uh, at the demonstration in front of the synagogue where illegally they were holding a session for selling illegally stolen Palestinian land. This is one more eyewitness uh, from a fellow uh, Muslim who, uh, Hussam is, is an active participant in uh, a group called uh, Pasadena for Palestine. Uh, they meet, and I am one of uh, the group, we meet every single Monday. Uh, we have a visual, it's an interfaith group, um, and we meet in front of Judy Chu's office. We've been meeting every single Monday since October, rain or shine. Uh, continuing to call for our representative to call for ceasefire and end to this genocide. In this video, Hussam will share uh, his experience and what he witnessed uh, during that uh, demonstration in front of the uh, synagogue that were selling illegally Palestinian held uh, land. Um, so let's, let's all watch his testimony. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Hassan. Uh, on, on Sunday, June 22nd, uh, we were made aware that an illegal land sale will be taking place at the synagogue at Hiko Robertson. The sale was for land in illegally occupied West Bank. The flyers that were sent out by the Zionist group read, and I quote, the best Anglo neighborhoods in Israel. It is our duty to raise our voice against this illegal land sale during the ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people. We showed up at the real estate event hosted at the synagogue around 12 p.m. We were on the sidewalk near the synagogue. Almost immediately, the police arrived 
and aggressively split the protests into two groups to weaken us and allow the Zionists to have better control. The police started to push us back and the Zionists were surrounding us as we were outnumbered. In addition to the support of the police, the Zionists had their own private security called Magnum, which employs ex-IDF soldiers. They were very organized and were very effective in flanking and separating our group and keeping us from being together to protect ourselves. We were maced, punched, kicked, and verbally abused. This went on for an hour or two. We finally started to regroup and attempted to walk away. As we walked away, the Zionists continued to follow and beat us for almost two hours. They were kicking, punching, throwing rocks, and pepper spraying us as we attempted to get away, hurling insults that cannot be repeated, and wished our brave women that stood against fascism to be physically assaulted and not in those words. It was a scary experience given the level of violence that was perpetrated against us and the fact that we were unable to leave. <clears throat> the police, for the po most part, either assisted or ignored the violence perpetrated against us right in front of them. Our group of five had to throw away all of our signs to attempt and blend in and walk away to our vehicle. We had one friend that arrived to the event by himself, but was unable to get back home by himself because he was badly maced. And we had to assist him all the way to our car and drive him home. Another comrade lost two teeth when the Zionist threw a rock at his face. I'm not sure how aware everyone is of the entire situation. The president, Mayor Pass, Governor Gavin Newsom, along with other genocide enablers, all came out and condemned the protest as anti-Semitic and completely ignored to mention that the illegal land sale was the reason for the protest. They obviously understood that if people knew why we were protesting, public opinion would be with the protesters. The Attorney General has said that the DOJ and the FBI will investigate the protesters, not, not the violent Zionists who were breaking both international law as well as U.S. law with this land sale. This is something of great concern for all of us, since we were, since we were aware of how repressive this regime has been against Palestinians and this movement for justice. To add insult to injury, the city of Los Angeles is planning to allocate a million dollars to the militia forces that were deployed against us, Maginam. This, this was changed to two million and to all places of worship and will be taken up during the, the city of Los Angeles next meeting, which I believe is end of July. I believe it's July 31st. We don't have the confidence that the majority of the money will not be going mainly to Maginam and we must mobilize to stop this funding of militias that will make our community unsafe and risk more violence to the anti-genocide protesters. We urge everyone to support the community and show up to these meetings and other community meetings to stop this genocide. Thank you. Uh, Mike, you, can you come up for a second? Mike? Is it, where's Mike? Yeah, come on up. Uh, I think he was at the event and we wanted him to say a few words. I want to also point to, there's an article in The Intercept called The Companies Making It Easy to Buy in the West Bank Settlement, in a, in a West Bank Settlement. And so it's a very uh, exhaustive uh, description of these land sales uh, being conducted here in the United States. And I also heard that there was supposed to be another land sale event in Beverly Hills, and that was canceled. So again, the work, the work of many of you is, is working. Uh, Mike, just go up. Uh, oh, yeah, you can just have a few minutes. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Just introduce yourself. Yes, greetings. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Patin, and I am, uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, on June 23rd, I had a situation where I was part of a smaller group, uh, which... Uh, arrived at the synagogue in the Pico uh, area of Los Angeles 
And uh, we were there basically to um, stop the sale of stolen land from Palestine. Um, just a couple of minutes of background on why we were there. I'm involved with a group of people who meet on a regular basis in, Sa in Pasadena. Uh, we are pro-Palestinian. We meet on Monday evenings. Uh, we also meet at the farmer's market in South Pasadena. We are a good group of pro-Palestinian people. We engage others in conversation about the issues. We are always where we need to be to show our solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Palestine. It is important to me. It is important to me to not only having been part of a workshop of Reverend James Lawson for many, many years on nonviolence, to actually find opportunities in my life to put his, uh, his ideology at work for me in my life and in the way that I can do it practically, um, exposing to family and friends all of what I feel have been injustices inflicted upon Palestine for decades. So um, as an activist, as a person who believes in nonviolence, I, I have to find ways to come together with other folks of like minds to understand that we individually have power to um, put whatever we believe in at work with others in community settings. So going back to the Pico Robertson neighborhood, uh, I arrived there with two of my fellow pro-Palestinian comrades, and almost immediately we were met with a very hostile group of people, uh, maybe 10 to 15. And that uh, very quickly rose to 100. And, and shortly, we were outnumbered significantly. We, we did our best after being pushed around. I was pepper sprayed twice. Uh, we were pushed around. The Los Angeles police presence was just presence, rather, was just a presence. They did nothing at all to stop any of the conflict. They did not play any kind of a role in mitigating anything that would come up between the two factions. So being in a fairly Zionist neighborhood, um, they were able to call reinforcements in, and so their group really rose tremendously. Um, there were innocent people who were there simply to be nonviolent, to simply take a stand against the sale of stolen property. Um, and we were not preventing anyone from going into the synagogue to worship. As far as I knew, uh, it was a Sunday. It was not a day of worship. Um, and so um, they had a, a line of security in front of them, the synagogue. Uh, we did not violate any of that line of security. We, we stood firm in chanting and indicating that we were there simply in support of justice for Palestinians. And we were mocked, we were called names. Um, as I said, some of us were pepper sprayed, including myself. Um, we had several flags that were, as was said before, those Palestinian flags were attempted to be stolen by, by the Zionist people there. Um, it was unnecessary conflict. Uh, we had a right to be there. We had a right to show our opposition to what we felt was illegal. And um, it was a, a terrifying experience for many people. Um, when, I, when I felt that it was time to say we needed to leave and, and uh, join up with other folks to make sure that others were okay, to make sure that our fellow pro-Palestinians were okay, um, the group would then follow people who were leaving, uh, follow people who were walking to their cars, follow people who were wearing a 
uh, you know, a very emblematic uh, scarf, uh, kafia. And um, so this was very, very troubling. So some folks who were driving their cars would actually escort others to their cars to make sure that they got to their cars safely. So it was, it was really um, quite um, a disturbing uh, situation for many. Um, but we left feeling that we had made a statement and that we were not going to give up and that we're, we'd be back uh, time and time again to thank show you. up. Yeah, right. And thank you, thank you for that. Can you, can you name the, the organization that you said you, where you meet? What's the name of the organization? Uh, it's a combination of several pro-Palestinian organizations that okay. um, meet and um, we demonstrate, uh, we basically march uh, through the Pasadena area and always carry the Palestinian flag. And uh, so I think we're making a connection with the community and uh, we're engaging more and more people in conversation. Well, thank you for what you do and thank you for your, your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanna transition, it's, it's kind of a shift to Joshua, uh, to you. You were also at another uh, event involving a synagogue and the selling by a real estate company, which is a for-profit entity. And there was obviously um, a clash there. And uh, our Omar Ricci attended a meeting with the mayor about that, and he's going to report on that. But I wanted you to have uh, hear your perspective on what happened that day. Well, you know, I just saw a video on Instagram um, of the brutality of, I don't know if many of you have seen it, of the brutality of the settlers coming up, uh, beating, beating and uh, brutalizing this family with metal bats. I don't know if any of you had seen it, but it was a, that was a, a good, yes, that was a great reflection of the type of people we were dealing with um, in front of the, I wouldn't even call it a synagogue, you know, I was raised Jewish and uh, I don't know any type of synagogue that um, would uh, run a, a stolen land real estate sale in, in, in their place of worship. That's where it, the first, one of the most fundamental Jewish laws is do not steal. Um, so I, it's just totally defiled, desecrated space. Right? Um, anyways, you know, I'm I'm five ten, so taller, fairly tall. You know, one eighty pounds. Nobody bothered me. You know, I was fine. But when I looked around at the protest, it wasn't me and the and the the taller, stronger people that were getting brutalized. It was elderly people, elderly people that showed up to protest. It was journalists. It was women, on our, on, not me, or or anybody that you know has a stronger physical presence. It was the most vulnerable. Uh, I remember even looking uh, to my side and seeing my comrade who, who who's in a wheelchair. I mean, the Zionists were coming up to him and punking him, a guy in a wheelchair. I mean, again, I repeat, it, it just felt like a reflection there of what we're seeing overseas in Gaza and the West Bank. Um, we When we first got there, um, we were on the sidewalk in front of that institution and the police came in right away. The police came in right away and they, they tried to push us off the sidewalk. They violated our basic fundamental right, as you said, to assembly and, and to protest on a public sidewalk. And we were letting them know about it too. You are violating my rights. No, I'm not going to leave. And 
I mean, it was just so blatant and flagrantly criminal. Um, and then slowly by slowly, we were getting pushed onto the street and more, more of the Zionists kept swarming in, swarming in, swarming in. We were seriously, uh, we, had a, we were at a serious disadvantage number wise. And things were going okay. I mean, it was chippy, but until provocations on the Zionist side started to happen. They started to try to steal the Palestinian flags that we were carrying. And that's when things really started getting more precarious. They were, they were st starting to, they were starting to try to take our flags and we were getting into face to face with them. And that's when I think fights really started breaking out. The bear spray came out. Um, it was, it was pretty surreal, <laughs> but, um, you know, it doesn't, it didn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is it didn't matter who you were. If you were on the, one of the people protesting the land sale, you could have been Jewish like me. You could have been a rabbi. You could have been anybody. They're not, they were, they were going to. Their goal was to intimidate and cause as much harm to you as possible. Uh, as, but, you know, they just were looking for the most vulnerable. And, uh, you know, the way they got chased out, if you, if you want to imagine the way that we were chased out of that um, neighborhood, just look at the videos of the settlers, as I said, the way they come and purge the homes and they try to push people out of their, of their lands. Matt, you know, they, they come in and, and they, a lot of them, you know, they're carrying some kind of weapon and, and they're just they're just swarming you. It's about numbers. It's like hyenas. Like they just come and swarm you and 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 and, and just push you out by force. So, you know, it, the the fact that all of this has not been condemned on that side and the land sales are there's still a land sale going on today, by the way. There's a land sale going on today and what has our elected officials done about it? What what has our mayor or anybody done about it? They've enabled the criminals. They've supported the criminal behavior. You know, and and it just makes me feel that this city is run by Zionist capitalist gangsters because that's how they behave. That's how they behave. You know, and that's what they're showing. So that's my view of what happened. I think we need to hear from Omar Ricci, who met with the mayor about the land sale incident at, at, at the synagogue uh, and the conflict that erupted after that. And I'm going to give him seven minutes. Let's give another round of applause to our heroes. Our heroes. Yes. They are a far better group than a lot of us who are older. All right, let's just go to the next slide since Salam has given me so little time. Um, you all, this was all sort of a background. You guys all know about this. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you heard about it as well that on June 23rd. So what, I'm, what I want to do is just quickly share with you the meeting with the mayor. And I really, it's the next slide then I wanna show you a picture of. This meeting happened on June 27th. This happened, uh, the, uh, the land sale event that was being referred to happened on June 23rd. This happened on June 27th. Uh, and this is a quote unquote interfaith meeting. And I put it in quotes because it did not represent all aspects of the faith. There were a lot of Zionists there, pro-Zionist Jews, but there were not any of the other elements of a Jewish community. And um, there were 23 representatives of the room there. Uh, uh, there were the Islamic centers represented there. Uh, the, uh, the two people up front, of course, you know, Mayor Karen Bass on the left there. And then next to her is uh, Councilwoman Katie Yaroslavsky of the 5th District, where the um, uh, Adas 
Torah uh, synagogue is and where the land where that held the uh, land sale, the land sale of illegal stolen land. Um, I just wanted to just give you a flavor of this meeting and what happened before this meeting. Uh, in the waiting room outside, you see the doors in the back there. We were all waiting outside before we came into the room. And um, uh, I won't go through the entire table, but there were, of course, you know, Jews, Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims. Uh, the, the, the Zionist groups that were represented were the Jewish Federation, the ADL, the synagogue that actually hosted the uh, land sale, the LA Board of Rabbis, and a couple of other uh, synagogues. Uh, and we were waiting outside before we came into the room. What was interesting was a tactic that I saw. We were just out there socializing, just like you were out there socializing before, and just saying hello to each other. And the Zionist elements approached the African American Muslims and started talking to them about all the funds that are available from the state and from the city. They were distinctly honing in on the African American Muslims. What are they doing? They are trying to separate out. They're trying to divide. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't talk to some of the other folks out there. There are tactics at play political tactics at play, be mindful, be aware. The idea is to say, and they actually did that with Salam. I remember still from about two decades ago where they said, Salam, if you recognize Israel or whatnot, we'll sing your praises to the sky. And so of course, Salam didn't, didn't of course bite on that. But the point is, is that that's a tactic. They try and separate you out. So we were in the room and I just want to tell you something. These people are powerful. There is just no other way to put it. They are powerful in the way they talk. They are po powerful in the money that they have. They are powerful in their demands. And so in the room, prior to this picture being taken, they said, our house of worship was attacked. They don't address the root cause. Our house of worship was attacked. You all need to sign a statement in support of us. And it was a very, and it was a unanimous voice from them. And uh, I'm sorry to say that there were some Muslims in the room that said, okay, we'll sign the document. And it took a couple of us to stand back and say, I don't think so. That is not our, <laughs> yes. It took a couple of us to say, uh, if you're not going to address the root cause of why People were there. They weren't protesting because you were a Jew. They were protesting there because you are a Zionist, or because you are selling land, uh, stolen land. <laughs> and if you want to use the guise of a house of worship attacked, being attacked, that's not going to happen. And so it is when, and this is what I, this is the thing I want to mention. Uh, there is a fear that some of us have that once you're actually in the, it's easy to be in a room where we're all thinking together the same way. It's easy to, 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 to have the same energy. But when you're in a room like that and you experience the other side, oh, it's a different story. Okay, so there, there's, a, there's a stark reality. But when you speak up, you gain respect. Let that be clear. If you just sit there and don't say anything and just give in and it's the power and it's the way that it is and, you know, Allah Alam and everything. When you speak up, you gain respect. And after that meeting, when a couple of us spoke up, I can tell you that the mayor asked to be in contact with me and that other person. Katie Arasowski asked to be in contact with me and that other person. And there is now uh, ongoing dialogue. Now, let me show you, yes. And by the way, it, it, I'm not gonna share everything because I don't wanna reveal everything here, but there is, there is, there is movement, there is, there is discussions happening. Let's move to the next slide real quick. Okay, one of the things that happened, there was uh, the day before that, that meeting with the, the interfaith community, uh, quote unquote, there was a resolution that was introduced in the LA City Council to give a million dollars to the Jewish Federation, which has over a billion dollars in assets, by the way, just down the street here, 
of LA, and a group called Magen Am, which is a armed Zionist militia, that's no other way to put it, here in LA that is quote unquote tasked with uh, protecting Jewish communities using our taxpayer dollars, all right? That motion was introduced by Katie Yaroslavsky and a couple of other uh, members of the council that, that co-sponsored it. And, um, and it came out the day before, and a couple things I wanna note about this. When we found out about, we found out about this after the interfaith meeting. And there were a couple of attitudes that came from our uh, camp, if you will. One attitude was, they're gonna do it. How can you, because when we talked about, hey, can we rally to oppose this? Can we, can we, can we come out against it? Uh, there was sort of this fatalistic attitude. Like, the, the machine is already working. We can't stop it. All we know is to know how to protest. But there was another camp that said, no, we're gonna organize against it. And in the next slide, the community rallied and actually defeated the motion. Okay? That happened in a matter of days. That happened in a matter of 48 to 72 hours. My point is, is that we should never, ever have a defeated mind mindset. The second thing is, the second thing is, engagement is a slow moving effort, but it works. It works. And let's go to the next uh, slide here. Okay, so next steps, there's still a ceasefire resolution that's being discussed. There's, I won't get into details, there's a lot of mechanics working behind the scenes behind that. Uh, the money from the defeated motion, they've now upped it to $2 million, and they're saying give it to uh, every, anybody who applies, not just for Maganam or whatever, but to anybody who applies. There's various schools of thought right now within our efforts. Some are saying we shouldn't be doing that. I see Salam really hovering around here, so I'm gonna try and wrap this up here. Uh, and that there's, there's internal community discussions underway. All right, next slide, and that's my final slide, so give me a second, bro. <laughs> so, so, I'm not the enemy. So, so the, the, one, the one thing I just wanna share, I don't wanna turn this into a chutpah, but, but let me just share with you a verse from the Quran that when I read it, I mean, it struck me like lightning. It says here, it says, I won't, I won't go through the entire thing, but basically it's describing the situation we are facing here today to a T. It's basically saying, hey, you Muslims, you guys who are constant in prayer and, and giving zakat and giving purifying dues, as soon as you're told to fight in God's cause, some of them stand up, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I just want to pray. <laughs> I, I just want to give the dues. I don't, I don't, you're telling me to fight? I don't want to fight. And so that's analogous to what we're experiencing. Some people, and, and rightfully so, I want to be clear, we have to be wise about how we deal with things. But if we somehow fear the Zionists, that, oh my God, they're too powerful, they've got the money and everything else, you are putting the Zionists above what God commands us to do. All right? I'm not saying we don't be stupid. I'm not saying these, these kids should, should absolutely withdraw. How about nonviolent fighting? Nonviolent fighting, yes, thank you. All right. But the point is, is that we are in genuine fear of being targeted, of being doxxed, of being uh, loss of our jobs. I, I, believe me, <laughs> I'm in that position, right? I been, but I know people in this room who've had family members that have been doxxed, right? But the final thing the verse says, the akhira, keep perspective. Know who's in charge. Know that God's promise is greater than anything these Zionists can ever, you know, who will be gone, inshallah. All right, God's promise is far greater. And so faith alone is not enough, but you've got to work for justice. Thank you very much. So I want to